come and to celebrate our Lord Jesus together as a faith family. Yes, Miss Alice is ready. I love it. Yes. <laughs> Honey, are you ready? No, she's not as ready. No. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm glad that you guys are here with your gifts and your talents, what God has gifted you with so that we could work together as a family. And uh, one of the awesome things that I love about being a part of a faith family is just our time to sing together, our time to be together, hear our collective voices and just have that camaraderie, that sense of like, yes, let's go get them, you know, because sometimes after a week you just get a little beat up and sometimes it's nice to hear your faith family join you in praise and it just rejuvenates the spirit. And so uh, let's begin this morning. If you're able, will you stand as we have our call to worship? And as always, we want to let the word of God be the thing that starts us off and is our plumb line for how we uh, have our attitude of worship and all that we do, whether it's music, prayer, or the reading of his word. And so this morning, we're going to have uh, uh, our call to worship taken from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. And if you follow along with me, starting in verse 6, it says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We've received reconciliation, so as a result, let's celebrate our God because of the fact that he's shown us amazing grace and given us just, uh, he, as one word I love that scripture uses is that he's lavished on us, like not just a little bit, but lavished. He, he loves us, lavishes us with all that he desires to give us. And so this morning, let's respond, uh, uh, giving him just that attitude that, uh, that he deserves. Sing with me as we, uh, we sing. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. Set free. 
you've done for me.
Got some praise this morning, amen. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come to sing high your praises, to give you all the glory that you alone are due. Holy, holy, holy is the name above all names, the name and the only name by which we find salvation and rest for our souls. God, we gather collectively as a faith family this morning just to sing your praises. And God, with these these prayers that are being lifted up, the, the words and the music and, and our, our attitudes, our focus on preparing our hearts to open your word. Let all of these acts of worship be pleasing to you because you alone are worthy of it. God, we pray not only for ourselves this morning in this congregation, but we pray for all of our brothers and sisters throughout our community and throughout the city that are proclaiming the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, move mightily in their congregations. Let people come to hear and be convicted of uh, uh, in your word and that they would respond and that the dead would come back to life, God, and that you would just uh, be moving powerfully in these communities not for our sake, not for our church's sake, God, purely for your glorification and that your kingdom work would be spread. God, we pray for all the pastors and leadership in these churches. Please equip them, embolden them, and help them to be able to speak, God, as you desire to say this morning. And this morning we pray also for our pastor. God, allow Pastor Steve to speak with boldness and truth as only you can give and help us, your church, respond accordingly. God, have your way in your church because we come to lift high the name above all names, the name of Jesus, and it's in that name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Good to be in the Lord's house. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm glad you guys are here with us today. Are you guys excited about Psalms, right? Lord saves. Yay. All right. I was hoping for a better rousing. Yay for the Psalms. No, I, I'm excited about Psalms. So here's, here's what we're going to do. We finished Easter for three weeks. We're going to be in Psalms, uh, Psalm 12, 13, 14, talk about the Lord saves. And then we're going to start First John because the world needs a little bit more love. Amen? Can we all use a little bit more love? Amen. Yeah. Like one of us, the rest of you guys too. We need more love. So the Lord saves. Uh, today we're, we're going to talk about the Lord saves. And really what we're going to focus on is God's faithfulness. And aren't you guys glad that we have a faithful God? Yes, and we, we have to have a faithful God because that's, like, that's our, 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 what we hold on to, right? The Lord is a, a bulwark never ceasing or never failing. It's, it's our God, our, 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 our firm foundation. It's, it's the one we cry out to when we're having a bad day. Amen? Yes, you guys cry out to God too, right? It's not just, not just Pastor Steve. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray and join our hearts as we uh, come to the Lord just boldly. We have boldness, access, confidence because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So we're going to go to God boldly. We're going to ask that he would just uh, touch our hearts as we study his word. And uh, we're going to trust that he will do that as we talk about his faithfulness. So please join your hearts with mine. God, thank you that you save us. Thank you, God, that you're faithful in your word, that your word is true and pure and right. God, today we thank you especially for Jesus Christ and the blood that flows down from that cross that binds us together as family. Lord, as we, as we study today, God, help us to know that we're never alone because we have our Christian brothers and sisters. God, most of all, because we have you and you, you hear our cries. You answer them, God, the way only you can. We thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, for his glory, amen. Amen. So today, uh, the Lord saves. And speaking, really focusing on God's faithfulness, what we're going to do is um, kind of big idea, right? Uh, we live in a broken world, and it can be hard. Amen? amen? Anybody else feel like the world is especially broken these days? Yeah, I bet we do this every generation. <laughs> Man, I remember 20 years ago, it wasn't this bad at all. What's happened? Right, but this is what we do. So um, it, it is bad, right? We live in a broken world. And if you don't believe me, turn on the news this afternoon and you'll see. Broken world, right? Yes. 
It's some response. It's a broken world, right? Everything's broken. It, it's, it's tough. And when we live in a broken world, sometimes we feel lonely. And so we need to remember that God is faithful, right? And so this is kind of the big idea is that we live in a broken world and it can be hard, but we have an awesome God. Amen? And so that's true. When we look at our big idea, it's what is true and, and what do we do? And so um, say the, the true part with me. Living in a broken world can be hard, but we have an awesome God. And stop. So that, that's true, right? It's true. Broken world. It's, it's rough out there. And sometimes we have bad days. And uh, anybody have a bad day yet today? Just, just wait. It's, it's going to happen. Uh, it'll happen. It's going to happen. If it's not today, it'll be tomorrow. But sometimes life's tough and, and, and the world's broken and you'll be on your way to work Monday and somebody's going to cut you off and they're going to tell you you're number one in the most colorful way and it's going to just ruin your day. The world's broken. It hurts, but we have an awesome God. And so in the text, what we find are these, these two kind of compelling and almost oppositional tensiony, pulling apart, banging together truths. And it's like, uh, okay, so God is awesome and God is faithful and he's wonderful and he hears your cries and man, God is there for you. Sometimes life really stinks. <laughs> and so what do we do? This is the, the last part of the, the big idea. We trust God to save us. Would you say that with me? We trust God to save us. Listen, uh, we, we do these big ideas. I do this every week because um, I don't just want you to listen to me. I'm, I'm not an entertainer, though I hope I'm a little bit entertaining. But we're learning God's word together. And when we look at a passage, we should look at it and we should say, okay, what is God teaching us here? And so part of it is what is true, and then the other part that we see is what do we do. And so what do we see today is that what is true is we live in a broken world, and it's hard, but we have an awesome God. And so what do we do? We trust him to save us. And the text then in Psalm chapter 12, uh, Psalm of David, right? David, remember King David, and we're going to look at this. This is what David says. He says, uh, save, save, O Lord, because the godly one is gone, for, for the faithful have vanished. Do you hear his brokenness from among the children of man? Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are with us. Who is master over us? Because the poor are plundered. Because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O oh Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side the wicked prowl as vileness is exalted among the children of man. Amen and amen. May the Lord add to the blessing of the reading of his word. Amen. amen. And so here we are, Psalm 12, King David writing. And David, if you, if you get it, right, he feels alone and broken and like every vileness is exalted. You ever look at the news and think vileness is exalted? A little bit sometimes. You just look around in the world and you see people glorify what is bad and they diminish what is good and it's just fighting, right? So um, David's living in a broken world and it's hard for him. And as we read the text, we, we get the sense of like sometimes life just stinks. Life's just tough. But in the midst of knowing life is tough, we have an awesome God. And so we trust this awesome God to save us, right? I mean, you guys with me? All right, so let's read the big idea together. Living in a broken world can be hard, but we have an awesome God, so trust him to save you or to save us, right? We trust God to save us today. Today we're going to trust God to save us in really four parts, um, four parts in the text. First, we're going to talk about living, living righteously can feel lonely. And, and we look at David, and if you look at the text, what, what you noticed as we read through it, we're, we're going to get back there, but, but David's like, where's the faithful people? Where did all my friends go? Just context, right? This is David. He's a Jew living in Israel where they're all Jews. It's like me standing up. Where's all the Christians? <laughs> it's like, I'm not really alone. Did you guys get that analogy? Right, so, and then, then we go on. So, but, but here's the problem. He feels alone. And he feels like all the faithful people, and everybody's lying, and vileness is being exalted. And so what does he do? Um, second, cry out to God for help. 
It's like, God, God, help me. I, God, I, don't, I don't know what to do. Help me. Why? Because the world's broken. What do we do? We, we cry out to God for help. And then, then third, and this is important, look, um, cry out to God for help, but trust God to hear you. And this is what David does. And it's important. And, and, and I think, listen, we, we have an awesome God. Amen? Amen? Our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. I'm glad we've got like two VeggieTales fans in here. That's awesome. So we have an amazing, awesome, righteous, holy, big God, right? But so sometimes, look, I don't mean this in a bad way, but, but sometimes I think we know intellectually that we have a God who's all-powerful, but we don't pray to him like he's that God. And, and so, so to get from number two to number three, we cry out to God for help, but then we really trust that God's going to hear us. And what we see in the text is that David does this, right? He's like, God, God, cut off their lips. I love that, by the way. And then he says, and God rose up, and God got up, and God protected them. Which is fourth, right? God saves. Listen, God, God will save you. God will take care of you. Amen? Um, the way God saves you doesn't always look like the way that we think it should. Because sometimes when we think that God should save us, it looks like Lamborghini. I could just get that, right? But that's not what God has in mind. What God has in mind is what's better for us than something that's flippant like that. And so God saves us, but in God's way. So um, check it out first, right? Uh, living righteously can feel lonely. And, and I like the way David does this. I want, I want you to just like, like take it in and put yourself in David's place. And, and just remember that this, is, this isn't just some guy. This is King David. King David, the man after God's own heart, the dude who slayed Goliath, he surrounded in Israel by Jews and um, the temple, all this stuff. Save, O oh Lord, for the godly's gone. The faithful have vanished. Everyone utters lies to his neighbors. They speak with a flattering lips and a double heart, double-minded heart, like they're, they're, they're divided. It's, you know, he spoke a long time ago, but sometimes it feels like it's today, right? Do um, you get it? The godly one is gone. Do you ever look around the world and, and just feel that way, like you're all alone? And um, th there's nobody there for you. And, and I think this is what David is getting at. Because he knows, maybe intellectually, like you might know intellectually, that you're not all by yourself. And I hope that you can look around the room and see that you're not by yourself. And I hope you have friends that are Christians. But sometimes life still feels that way. Amen? And you feel like David and you feel like God, all the godly people are gone. And out of all the people I interact with, nobody is faithful anymore. They've all vanished. And everybody is just uttering lies. And, um, and life just kind of stinks right now. And so as we look at this, I, I want you to know that living righteously can feel lonely. As we look at just maybe five points from the text. First, uh, David, David was a man after God's own heart. Do you remember that? God, God had um, Saul, and he takes David, and he says, look, Saul, Saul has not obeyed me. He's not followed me, but I've raised up for myself a man after my own heart. It's David. David, the man after God's own heart, felt like he's all alone, and everybody faithful has vanished, and like, he's, it's, woe is me. And, and what I want you to know this morning is that if you're a godly person, and you feel all alone, it doesn't mean that you're faithless. Right, does that make sense? I, I, let, me, let me try to say that again because I think, think this is, this is important for us as Christians. Christian. Do you understand? David is a Christian. He's a faithful guy. He loves God and he followed God. And he had problems in his life like you and I have problems in our life, but, but he was firm in his faith and he always repented and he got, he got back on track. And he's, he's a man after God's own heart. And he got to a place in life where he said, I'm all alone, God. Depression, right? Anxiety. And maybe you're here today and you've been through that in your life. And it doesn't make you a loser Christian. Do you understand? Are you with me? It's okay to feel like you're alone and you live in a broken world. God still loves you. And it makes you human. And it makes you like guys like David. You know, David wasn't just a man after God's own heart, but he saw God do amazing things. Do you remember David and Goliath? Do you remember the story? This is, this is, this is the guy, the kid, where, where Goliath is standing there and David comes out and Goliath's like, why do you send dogs to do a man's work? Like, you want to fight me? Send a real man out. And David picks up these stones and with some little stones, he kills the giant Goliath. Boom! 
Goliath is, is dead. David's warrior cuts off his head. He's like, I'm the man. I've seen God do amazing stuff in my life. And I'm all alone. <laughs> and I'm really bummed out because I live in a broken world. So, maybe you're here and you can remember that time in your life where you're like, man, God was just working and God was on fire and it was just, it was so amazing. And later in your life, you feel like you're all alone and broken and everything's falling apart. It doesn't make you a broken Christian. It just means you're living in a broken world. But you still have a great God. Amen? It doesn't stop there. Like, we go to other guys. Remember Elijah? Uh, David feels alone, surrounded by evil, right? But you remember Elijah? Do you guys, do you guys know Elijah? Um, Elijah is this prophet of God. And Elijah, if you go to 1 Kings, right? 1 Kings, I actually like this passage. And, and I want to read some because I think it really makes this point about what David is feeling and what we feel. And Elijah is this guy, right? He's a, a prophet of God. And he's on one side in, in, in chapter 18. And the prophets of Baal, 500 of them, they're on the other side. And they, they set up two altars, right? The prophets of Baal have an altar. And Elijah has an altar. And they have this competition. You call down fire from your God. And I'll call down fire from my God. And the real God will prevail. And so Elijah, he makes fun of these guys like all day. And they're prancing around the altar and, and, and Elijah is saying things. You, you read about it. He says, hey, maybe your God is hard of hearing. Speak louder. Maybe your God has gone to the bathroom to relieve himself. Maybe he'll come back and then he'll, and it's in the Bible. It's, it's funny because it's true, right? He, maybe he's on vacation and he's, he, he's, he'll come back and then he'll answer you and he mocks them and he laughs at them. And then um, he prays and God sends fire and it consumes the altar and all 500 of the false prophets end up dead. And then, and then uh, this lady, Jezebel, she hears what he did. And Jezebel, in chapter 19 and verse 2, sent a messenger to Elijah and threatened to kill him. In verse 3, then he was afraid, and he arose, and he ran for his life to Beersheba. Just, just, you got to appreciate that, right? Here's a guy that saw fire from heaven, 500 prophets dead, and he's running from a girl. He's living in a broken world, and he feels all alone. And as you keep reading, do you know what he says when he gets there? In verse 4, he went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and he sat down under a broom tree. And I can picture Elijah, this prophet, this guy who just had this amazing God experience, and he asked that he might die, curled up in maybe a fetal position, and he doesn't know what to do. And he says, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he laid down and he fell asleep. And what we get a picture of is this guy who feels completely alone. In fact, he even says in verse 10, he says, I've been jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken the covenant and they've killed your prophet with the sword. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life. Do you know what Elijah experienced is I think what David experienced, which I think is what a lot of us experience sometimes, which is just this, deep darkness of the weight of living in a broken world and feeling all alone. You ever feel that way? Doesn't make you like a loser Christian. It just makes you a human Christian Amen. living in a broken world. But by the way, um, David wasn't alone, was he? No, he wasn't alone. He always had people with him. You read about it, First and Second Kings, all, all the Samuel, um, read about it. David wasn't alone. Elijah wasn't alone. Later, in, in 1 Kings 19, God says, there's at least 7,000 people that have never bowed the, the, the knee. You're not alone, Elijah. Christian, do you, do, you know, do you know what? Maybe you feel all alone because you're in this broken, dark world and depression and anxiety is setting in. You're not alone, right? Like, I want you to know, just for reals, yo, <laughs> We're here for you, right? Like, just look around. This is, it's real life Christianity. Everybody should have a 2 a.m. friend. Amen. You should have somebody, right? You should have, in this room, you call me. My, my cell phone number's all over the place. It's not a fake offer. It's not like, oh, let me pay. But it's like, really, just you, for reals. You, you can call. It's okay. And we should be there for each other, right? Because that's Christianity. And evil in the world makes us feel alone, but we don't, we don't have to be alone. Um, the world is broken. I feel like it's just getting worse and worse. <laughs> We're depressed and the world is broken. Woe is me. Uh, look at what he says, though, 
And, and I think it's important because, uh, remember, we're, we're doing Truth Project on Wednesdays, and uh, Michael Porter's teaching, and it's in there, and it's 6.30, and part of what the, the point is, you look at the broken world, how do you find the truth? How do you find God's truth in, in, in everything that's out there, right? The world's broken. Um, David goes through this, and he says, look, uh, they're, they're, the, the godly people are gone. Do you ever look at the world, and you feel like godliness is pushed aside? And he goes on and he says, not, not only are, are the godly people gone, but the faithful have vanished. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. Anybody else distrust almost everything you hear on the news anymore? The fact checkers need to be fact checked. Right? Like, I mean, this is, it sounds funny, but we've lived in this, this society where the, the, the flattering voice like, oh, they just tell you whatever you want so you vote for them. Even if it's not true. They'll tell you whatever you want so you watch their news channel or, or whatever. I mean, th this is the world we live in. Lies everywhere. Everyone utters lies or so it seems. We feel like we live in this broken world. The evil take advantage of people. They're, they're merciless. Do, do you see what, what the way David says it is he talks about um, the, 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 the needy groan and the poor are plundered. And, and he goes on and at the end he says, vileness is exalted among the children of man. You ever feel like we live in a world where vileness is exalted and godliness is pushed aside? You can think of lots of things, you know. Just think about uh, all kinds of crazy things that the world celebrates that really aren't godly. When I, when I read this stuff, I, immediately my brain goes to like the abortion industry. That we have uh, like millions and millions and millions of dollars. People are making profit killing babies. That, that's wrong. Right? It's bad. It's not godly, but it's exalted in our society when godliness is put down. Um, the world is broken, but Jesus is coming back. And so there's hope. Amen? There's hope. And so we're still on big number one. We're, we're going to get to the other three points about this. But um, the world is broken. When it's broken, we feel alone. And depression might set in, and we, we focus. We, man, the world is broken. But, but we know now that um, even in the psalm, there's, there's hope, there's salvation. We know Jesus is coming back, right? Christ is coming. So the whole creation groans. The reason that, that work is hard sometimes, the reason we have weeds in our garden or the rabbits eat the fruit before we can harvest, all that stuff is because sin, right? Brokenness, hurt, pain, suffering, darkness, all of that is sin. And we're weary, amen? Anybody weary? Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and following, he says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I can't help but think when Jesus said that, he knew that we were gonna be tired. Because of sin, right? Like Jesus, he's not a fake offer. Jesus is like, I know you're going to get to a place in your life when it's going to be tough. And when you get to that place, come to me and I'll give you rest. Like I'll take, but I'll take your yoke with you. I'll take my yoke. I'll help you. I'll walk beside you. I'll be there for you. Come to me. Amen. This Jesus cares for you. You know, First, first Peter 5, 7, that it says, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Do you understand? This is a Christ that lives like we live. This Jesus, he lived in the world. He experienced the, the tribulation, the difficulty, the hurt, the pain. The cross is an example where he was beaten, bloodied, nailed to the cross, crown of thorns, blood dripping down, died as he's pierced in his side, rose from the grave. He understands your pain and your hurt. He was abandoned by his people. You ever think you feel alone? Jesus understands. Jesus gets it. And he says, come to me if you're weary and heavy laden. Cast your cares upon me because I care for you. And he's coming back. And so we know that even though the world is tough today and that uh, it, it's, it's not good and sometimes it feels bad and it feels broken and it hurts and there's darkness or there's pressure or there's whatever, we know that Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, when he comes back, he's going to take his own to him. Right? He's going to receive his bride. He's going to receive the church. He's going to receive you guys to himself. So what do we do? We cry out for help. And I like, the way, I like the way David does this. Um, I like the way David prays. Can, can I say without offending everybody? David prays manly prayers. <laughs> so, so here's what he's doing. He's like, there's a bunch of liars out there and, and they're flattering lips and they're just deceiving people and they're taking advantage of everybody. I'm gonna pray about this. God, please cut off their lips. <laughs> and cut out their tongues, right? Like, um, do, you ever, do you ever feel like praying that way? Yeah. Now you have permission. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And is it, like, so, right, just let me give some balance to that because I do think that's right. I think it's a righteous way to pray. I think when we see evil in the world and we say, God, crush the evil person that is destroying the, the helpless person. Like, God, I think that's good, good and righteous and okay, but we need to balance it with all the other times when we should be praying, God, save that person. Love that person. Show grace and mercy to that person. And, and, and so when, when David prays, what I want you guys to get out of the prayer is uh, three things, right? Um, three things. Pray quickly, pray directly, and pray fervently. There's a time in life, right? So David is, is, so go back all over the Bible. There's prayer examples. Pastor Robert talked about prayer from high priestly prayer last week in the book of John where, where, where Jesus is with his disciples and, and he's praying at the end of John. Um, so today, it's fast prayer. Ever live in a place where you gotta pray fast? And some, sometimes your prayer is just like, God save me. <laughs> or God cut off their lips. <laughs> it's quick. It's, it's quick. It's fast. Like there's a time, listen, there's a time when you need to pray for, for maybe half an hour, when you pray for hours and, and long, long, long prayers. It's also a time when short prayers. And, and, and here's, here's what I want you to understand. Praying fast doesn't mean you're not like super Christian. Do, do you understand? Are you with me? Maybe you're having a bad day and you feel like everything's against you and around you and the violence is exalted and you've got like 30 seconds. You can pray something quick and you can trust God to answer your prayer and be there for you. Amen? Amen. Um, pray directly, directly. Pray directly to God. Ephesians uh, chapter 3, I, I said this earlier, we have boldness, access, confidence because of Jesus Christ. Pa Paul mentions these three things in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 12. He says, you have boldness and you have access and you have confidence. You know, we, we have access to God Almighty and it should be joyful for us. Do, do you know, um, I, I would love to pray for you. I, I'll pray for you anytime. Like, you don't need me to pray for you. You, Christian, have access to Almighty God all by your lonesome. Do you understand? Uh, we, we need to pray for each other. That's a good thing. It's a godly thing. The Bible teaches we pray for each other. We pray for the same. We, we, we need to be there for each other in real life. But every Christian, every brother and sister here, you, we need to understand we can pray directly to God. God's open. Jesus has opened that door. He's torn the curtain. We have access, boldness, confidence, and then pray fervently. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus does this. I, I like the way um, David does it. I think David's um, inclination to say, pray, cut off their lips, cut off their tongues. I think it's, it's this emotional, it's this, this fierceness, it's this, this fiery prayer, this fervency in prayer. It's, God, I, I want this more than anything. Save the people who are perishing and get rid of the unrighteous. God, I, I just, that's my heart's desire. That's what I get from David's prayer. Like, I don't think David really wants him tortured. I don't think that's the inclination of our hearts or his, and I don't think it's God's. But I think it's fervency. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, keep seeking, keep knocking, right? Like, like go, go for it, go for it, go for it. If it means a lot to you, you pray a lot about it, amen? amen. Like, I just shouldn't be quick. It should be fervent, over and over and over. Maybe it's a quick pray, prayer. You, you say it's always on your, your mind, always on your heart, always part of your life because it means something to you. It, it's fervent prayer. And so what, what do we see? Sometimes it's lonely when you're living righteously in a broken world. And so two, we, we cry out to God. And then three, we, we trust that God's going to hear our prayers. Amen? And, and I like the way David does this. Because let me, let me say, again, right, I mentioned this earlier, if we, we pray to God, but we don't trust that God's going to do something with that prayer, like if we don't really, really believe that this God is so big and so mighty and that there's nothing our God cannot do, then what's the point in praying to him? Amen? Do, do you guys see the, the, the way it goes there? And what David is doing is he's looking at God and he's saying, because the plur, this is, this is God's response, right? It's God's response in the psalm. God is saying, because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise. And so what we see is action. I, I read a, a, a pastor friend on Facebook or whatever. He said, God is not a passive God. God is active. Do you understand? God, God is active. And if God is active, we should be active. And, and we, we, we are, we're like body of Christ, we're, we're active in the world. We don't just sit around with slacktivism or, you know, don't Facebook about it, but get out there and do something in real life, right? Real life, because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will arise. God is gonna get up and God is gonna do something. And, and I think that's important. And he goes on, he says, the words of the Lord are pure. 
Do you remember the world is full of lies and corruption and flattering speech, but the words of the Lord are pure words, and they're like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times, or perfectly purified words of God coming down for you. And you can trust them. Amen? You can, you can trust God's words. It's not, it's not something that's um, insignificant or something that we can't take to the bank, but because we live in a dark place, and we cry out to God, we trust God, and we know that God's words are absolutely right. So um, trust God, right? Three things I want you to get from the text that I want you to see. The Lord hears the cries of the needy. And by, needy is not poor. Poor in spirit, broken. Be, people who need God. D David, David wasn't needy, by the way, was he? Not in a physical sense. He's King David. And he's a warrior David. He's strong and he's got money and he's tough. And so he cries to God and says, God, please help us. And so why does that matter? Crying out to God doesn't make you a sissy. Amen? Right? Like, it's, pray a manly prayer if it makes you feel better. Just understand that calling out to God, God is bigger and stronger than all of us. And so we cry out to God and we cry honestly to God. We tell God what we need and we trust God to do it because God hears our cries. God protects the vulnerable. God protects the vulnerable. Now, not always as we think, uh, but, but God has a plan and God will absolutely uh, do what he says, which is the third thing. God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. If God tells you, you can take it to the bank. And so when you pray to God, we, we, we should pray to God like we really absolutely believe that God can do big, amazing things. Amen? Amen. Which is to say that prayer shouldn't be a last resort, but a first thing that we do, a first line of offense that we should start with prayer, not just be like, oh, man, there's nothing else I can think of to do. Guess we'll pray about it. It should be the opposite, right? Let's pray about it so that we can have power. And uh, I think that the focus here is on trusting God. Um, I think sometimes as Christians, we, we, we know right, that God is all-powerful and all-sovereign. But, but sometimes I don't think that we trust him in that same way. Does that make sense? I don't mean that in, offensive, in, in an offensive way. I think that's all of us, myself included, that I don't think our, our faith is what it ought to be sometimes. And so, so I think in, in Joshua, what we see is this idea of trusting God, and, and Joshua goes through, and um, we, we could go there, spend a lot of time in Joshua 1, but let me just tell you the point. Um, God says to Joshua, hey, be strong and courageous, which we could translate trust God. Right, because here's Joshua's story. God has Moses. Moses dies and Joshua's raised up and God says, Joshua, you're gonna go and you're gonna do what Moses failed to do. Now go, and Joshua's gotta do what? Trust God. Trust God. Like, be strong and courageous. I'm, I've got this task for you. I've got this purpose for you. Be strong and courageous. Hey, church, God has a mission for his church. Did you guys know that? It's that we should go make disciples. It's that thing we read at the end of every service. Right? And, and we do that. And so what, 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 be strong and courageous. Do what God says. Trust God. God says to Joshua, Joshua, do what I say. Don't turn to the left or to the right. Always do what the law has commanded. Follow what God has said. Listen, when we trust God, we do what God says. Amen? Amen. One guy says that faithful living, faithful living is doing what God says even when it, when it doesn't feel right. And we could go give examples of that all day. Um, God says that you should love your neighbor. Anyone have a neighbor they don't want to love? <laughs> People are like, I'm not raising my hand, Pastor. <laughs> my neighbor might see me on Facebook. Yeah, right? But it's true. Even if you don't like your neighbor, you love him. Amen? That's living by faith. It's trusting God. God says do that, and, and God is with you. God, God is with you. God says to Joshua, everywhere you go, I will be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll always be there. The Great Commission passage I mentioned just a minute ago that we read, read at the end of every service, it ends with something like, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth or the end of the age, or behold, I'm with you always, right? Jesus is saying, I'm with y'all. Church, come on, trust me. And and still, sometimes we have trouble with it. And if we trust God, then God will give us good success. And so maybe what we should do is think about ways in our lives where we're not trusting God like we ought to be. Did you know, did you know God is faithful to save people if we just share the gospel with them? Did, did, you, did you know that? 
Do you know that if we would go out there in the world and we would share the gospel, tell people that uh, Jesus, Jesus loves you so much that he died for you, right? Because you and I, because we're sinners, we've fallen short of God's holy, perfect, righteous standard, that God said you deserve death, and Jesus stepped up, and Jesus said, I'll, I'll die for you. And Jesus did die. He did die for you, and he died for me, and he died for the sins of the world. And because he's righteous, he was raised from the dead, right? He, he raised again. He ascended to heaven. He's coming back. And if you would trust Jesus, he would save you. And if you go share that gospel with people, you know, God is faithful to save. But when's the last time we shared the gospel with somebody? Be strong and courageous, church. Trust God that God would lead you. And then, and then we find out that God will save us, right? So, so, so the progression in the text, what we see is that David, like us, is living in this broken world. And in the broken world, sometimes things are tough, and so we cry out to God. And when we cry out to God, we cry out to God with manly prayers or womanly prayers, <laughs> and we trust that God's gonna answer us, right? And when we trust God to answer us, we understand that God is gonna save us. And here's what the text says, you, O oh Lord, will keep them you'll guard us. And I love the way this plays out because what David does is he tells us that God is going to save us, but then he also mentions that violence is exalted. And so what he says is, you, oh Lord, you're going to keep them. You're going to guard us from this generation forever. And God, as you're guarding us from this generation forever, there's wickedness and evil on all sides and violence is exalted. Do you understand, church, that in the Psalms and in real life, that God saving us and God protecting us doesn't mean that we get to step out of the valley of the shadow of death into some, I don't know, rainbow land. It's all, <laughs> trying to think of something happy. All I could think of was unicorns and Skittles and stuff, right? But that's not real life. Real life is, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God is with me, right? Because you protect me, God. Not because you remove me out of the darkness, but the, in the darkness, you walk beside me. And so God will save you. And in Christ, in Christ, we have victory over the world. Do you get that? In Christ, in Christ, we have victory. In Christ, we, we win the battle. We're, we're winners, amen? Yay, winners! <laughs> Yay! I don't watch sports, but I do whatever they do when winners are in sports. Like, raw. Uh, we win the battle. <laughs> We win, right? Where's the cheerleader when you need one? We, we win. In Christ, you win. Do, do, do you get that? We're, we might be down for a little while. We might be pressed, but we're not destroyed. We might be persecuted, but we're not crushed. Our God is bigger, and God's going to win. Amen? Christ is going to win for us. Read Revelation 19. You see a picture of Jesus Christ, vestured, dipped in blood, riding on a white horse, sword coming out of his mouth, decimating the armies that are against him. And behind him are all the Christians, the saints, arrayed in white. Because we've been washed by that blood that's on his vesture. Uh, in Christ, we receive redemption. And in Christ, we're adopted into God's family. And, and I love this when we talk about salvation. I love the picture of adoption. If you ever adopt somebody, you go to court and you stand before a judge and the judge pretty much, he tells you, he says, um, if you sign these papers and you agree to this, there's no backsies, <laughs> right? Like, you can't trade this one in later if you don't like him. <laughs> do, you, do you understand why that's important for your salvation? You're adopted into the family of God and you're co-heirs with Christ. And if you messed up a little bit, God ain't gonna trade you in for something better. Like bad English intended, he's just not going to do it. You're part of the family of God, co-heirs with Christ, and you're adopted in his family forever. And so all that brings us today, then, in this world, um, even when you feel alone and surrounded by darkness and evil, you can trust God to save you. And, and that applies to us this morning on, on, on at least two levels. First, first of all, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Today is the day of salvation, right? Today is the day when you can cry out to God. You can say, God, save me. God, I understand that I'm a sinner, that I've fallen short of your glory and your holy, perfect standard. God, I, I know that I've, I've been a rebel. I've been against you. I've, I've been, however you want to say that, or characterize sin. Right? God, I know that that's me. And God, I also know that you sent Jesus to die for me so that instead of being part of the darkness, the bad part of the world, I'd be part of your light and your brotherhood and be adopted. And God, today, I want to receive you as my Lord and Savior. 
If you'd pray a prayer like that or cry out to God that way, God would absolutely 100% save you today because you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The other level, which I think this applies to us, <laughs> if I don't die, I, <laughs> oh man, is, uh, <laughs> is, <laughs> is Christians, we need, to, we need to trust God daily in our living. Amen? Amen. We, we don't trust God just for the point of salvation, but maybe you're going through that dark time right now. And today, we're going to pray and we're going to stand. And this is the time when you would cry out to God and ask God where you need to trust him more and ask him to strengthen your faith so that you would go forward in life in a better position. Amen? Amen. So would you pray with me? Would you stand as we pray so that we could respond better? God, we thank you for Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for the salvation that we share in him. God, I pray that today, that this morning, you, you would show us where our faith needs to be strengthened. God, help us trust you more Father, this morning. And we thank you for this, Lord, in Jesus' name, for his glory. Amen. Amen.
be shaking, huh? Hey, so one quick announcement, and then we'll read our Great Commission passage. On uh, May 16th, we're going to have Cake Bake to raise money for kids and youth camp. Yay, kids and... So we will have kids and youth camp uh, this summer. And uh, I know it seems like maybe late notice, but we were just informed this past week that camps will be open. So we're going to have a place for our kids to go. Um, two camps, one will be for children, one will be for youth, both in the state. And so they'll be close. They'll be less expensive and they'll be a little bit shorter. Some of this is just like COVID modifications, lots of outside stuff. It's going to be great, a lot of fun. Um, and so on May 16th, Cake Bake, the way that'll work is the church will provide food. It'll be right after church and there'll be like food out there. And then we'll ask you guys to make cakes and we'll auction them off, right? So it's going to be fun. Yay. And I've heard there's some really good cakes that have moving parts and stuff. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. I'm just looking in that. I want to see a moving cake because I think that would be cool. Um, but we want to support our kids. Amen? Amen. And this will be a fun way to hang out. We'll get some harnesses out. You guys will race on the rock wall. We'll just play and, and have fellowship. And it's going to be a good time, right? So uh, more details will be forthcoming, hopefully on something printed out so I don't have to remember everything. And... Uh, <laughs> So I want to be sure you guys get it on your calendar, right? So May 16th, start baking your cakes and saving your money so you can support kids going to camp because uh, that'll be a good thing. And, and hopefully if we have a good uh, cake bake, maybe kids will go to camp for almost free, which would be great. Um, by the way, with that, if you have kids and they want to go to camp, we'll make sure they can go, right? So uh, money is not going to be something that will keep anybody from going to learn about Jesus, right? So that's important to know. Hey, let's read our Great Commission passage. Remember, uh, we exist to make disciples for, for God, right? And so it's not so much that God has a mission for his church as that he has a church for his mission. And the mission is the Great Commission that we would make disciples. We start here at the First Baptist Church all throughout the valley to the uttermost parts of the world. We want to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right, Pastor Jerome, would you lead us in this? <laughs> let's read. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Hey, God bless you guys. Have a fantastic week as you trust God to save you in the midst of a broken world. Hey, thank you for listening with us today and worshiping with us today. Let me, let me remind you that we're always here for you virtually and in real life. Look, you could click on the link and go to our website and submit prayer requests. You can find our phone number. Uh, mine's available. I would love to get to know you better over the phone or Zoom or in real life if you're up for going out for a cup of coffee or um, sharing a meal together. Um, however we can serve you, please let us know. And especially know that the reason we do this is to strengthen your relationship with Jesus Christ to make disciples, not just here at Albuquerque's First Baptist Church, but throughout New Mexico and to the uttermost parts of the world. Listen, today, if, uh, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, let today be the day of salvation. Let today be the day that you cry out to God and say, God, I know I'm a sinner, but I also know Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. Today, I put my trust fully in him. And if you do that and talk to God, he would save you and your life will never be the same.